Great. Um, thank you again for having me this morning, almost this afternoon. I think Sally teed up my discussion um, perfectly as far as the implications of ammonia emissions with regards to what EPA is doing to regulate or potentially regulate. Um, I'm standing before you today to basically say that the San Joaquin Valley is moving in a different direction than what Sally was talking about. Um, we believe through scientific evidence that reducing NOx emissions, at least for the San Joaquin Valley Air Basin, is the most effective strategy to reduce ammonium nitrates um, pollution, which is a significant contributor to our PM 2.5 um, problems. So I just wanted to real quickly, since we're here in Seattle, uh, go over the background as far as air quality management districts, air pollution control districts in California. There's 35 of them that are responsible for implementing federal, state, and local regulations. Our regulations vary uh, for those who have a larger air quality problem, San Joaquin Valley being one of them, South Coast being the other. Uh, we generally have more stringent rules and regulations. The San Joaquin Valley Air District is the largest air district in terms of size in California. Uh, we cover approximately 25,000 square miles of area. So here's a picture of the district uh, in the center of California. We have very hot, sunny, long summers. These are great uh, for producing and, and conducive for producing ozone uh, pollution in the summertime. That is the chemical reaction of emitted VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and NOx. Put that into the sunlight, bake it in the heat, you get a really bad ozone problem. We also have a PM or particulate winter problem. That's because we have cool, not relatively cold, but cool winters. Um, we have very, very stagnant conditions. There's not a lot of air mass movement through those winter time. Uh, and then also uh, foggy winters on occasion. And that helps uh, uh, create the particulate problem. Basically, the emissions just basically stay in the valley. All of those conditions, whether they were conducive for forming ozone or particulate, are important for why the agriculture is so important in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, those long hot summers allow the, the plants to grow, the not freezing temperatures allow for that production. Again, you're probably all familiar with this, the number one agricultural region in the nation, we produce nearly half of the um, fruits and vegetables and nuts in the uh, U.S., greater than 400 commodities, um, over uh, almost 50 billion in ag production, 21 billion in exports. And then the top commodities are milk and dairy products, including, uh, and then also almond and grapes. So this slide is a great example or a great uh, picture of the topography of the San Joaquin Valley. You couldn't tell in the previous uh, picture, but we're surrounded by mountains uh, to the east and to the west and specifically to the south. The, the, the wind flow is predominantly from the northwest uh, heading southeast. And so the pollution gets trapped in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, also, with those winters and the stagnation uh, periods, we frequently get an inversion layer. This is a layer of warmer temperature above, uh, above the San Joaquin Valley. And it basically acts like a lid that uh, doesn't allow the pollution to escape. And so for us, we only have about 4 million people throughout that 25,000 square miles of, um, of area, but we have equivalent air quality problems uh, similar to the South Coast that has 21, 20 plus million in population with larger industries. Um, that shows the low tolerance of the pollutants is because we're surrounded by the mountains and then those weather conditions. Um, we also deal with economic challenges, high unemployment rates. Uh, we have a larger uh, population growth, so more people in the San Joaquin Valley in these future years are projected. And then we have two major hubs going through uh, that, that connects Los Angeles to the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, which is the I-5 and Highway 99, which we just get transport emissions through uh, throughout the San Joaquin Valley. Because of our problems, 
Uh, we, we've implemented a multifaceted strategy. Um, we've implemented the most stringent regulations in the nation to control these emissions. The Air District uh, is only responsible for stationary source emissions. We've seen an 80% reduction since the formation in the early 90s. Um, we've adopted generations of rules, over 600 rules and regulations. Um, we're also adopting a lot of rules and regulations that are, uh, that are creating the model for the rest of the nation to follow. Uh, we recently got EPA to approve a rule that allows us to get credits, uh, state implementation plan credits or SIP credits for our incentive programs. This is the first of its nation, kind of lays the foundation for anybody else who has incentive programs to, to follow. Speaking of incentive programs, since we don't have the opportunity to regulate emissions from mobile sources uh, and other pollutants, we've tried to reduce those emissions by spending money and asking volunteers or participants to replace their units. Um, and so we've spent over a hundred uh, billion dollars in public and private investments uh, with reducing over 100,000 tons of emissions. And then we definitely get the public and the, um, the businesses involved through uh, participating in reducing air pollution. So this kind of shows the chart as far as uh, the design value. So Sally was talking about PM fine, which is PM 2.5. You can see in the far uh, left, We've seen a reduction in PM 2.5 emissions. Uh, it kind of peaks in the middle, circled in the red. Uh, sorry for the eye test, you can't really read that. But we saw wildfires in the San Joaquin Valley uh, or in California in the 2008 region. And so it affected PM 2.5 emissions. Uh, this is for annual PM 2.5 trends. You see two lines on there. That's the 1997 standard of 15 micrograms per cubic meter, and then the 12 microgram standard that was adopted in 2012. You can see how far away we're still from attaining those standards. Um, we're, as uh, JP was mentioning, we're serious non-attainment for the PM 2.5 uh, standards, including the oldest uh, 1997 standard. So here's for the PM 2, or this is for the 24 hour standard. So the, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards for PM fine is two different standards. Here's the 24 hour standard. We're just about into attainment with the 65 microgram. That was the 97 standard. Um, we're not nowhere near the, the 35 microgram standard that, that EPA adopted in 2012. Um, we're trying to create attainment plans to get there. Um, but again, a long, a long uh, path ahead of us in order to get down to those federal, quote unquote, clean air attainment uh, levels. As I was stating, we've reduced NOx emissions quite significantly. Uh, this is just a snapshot starting in 2005. It actually even goes higher if you go back into the early 90s. Uh, but we're, we've reduced NOx emissions significantly from about 454, 60 tons a day projected to go out into 2020 um, down to the 250, uh, 200 ton uh, per day levels. Uh, you can see that it's broken up. Mobile source uh, contributes about 80 to 85% of our PM, our, of our NOx emissions. Uh, and again, the San Joaquin Valley has an, it doesn't have the ability to control those. So we're working with the state California Air Resources Board, EPA, to, to help us. Uh, but, NOx is still very important as far as the, <clears throat> the control of particulate matter. So just taking a quick step back, I don't know how many of you really understand how small PM fine or PM 2.5 is. A strand of your hair, if you look at it, is about 60, 70 micro, microns in uh, diameter. You can place 20 PM 2.5 uh, particles across that strand of human hair. So we're really talking about very, very minute, very fine particulate uh, that, that, that can get embedded into the lungs, which causes a lot of health issues. So PM 2.5 is formed in a number of different ways. Uh, you can get gaseous emissions. We're talking about these precursors that Sally was talking about. We're talking VOC, ammonia, SOX emissions, which forms into um, uh, sulfuric acid and NOx or NO emissions, which forms to uh, nitric acid. Those will combine into the atmosphere, atmosphere through chemical reactions to form particulates. You can also get directly emitted particulates, which is a less of a source for us in the San Joaquin Valley. 
Next slide is, is the breakdown of, of the, the various components that we see in the San Joaquin Valley. These two show uh, Bakersfield on to the left and Fresno on the right. Uh, in the red, which comprises a large portion of the particulate co components or composition, is ammonium nitrate, about 65% in the Bakersfield area. And then in Fresno, it's a little bit less, um, not as agriculturally uh, surrounded. Uh, it's only about 54%. But you can see that there is a large contribution of ammonium nitrate in the total PM uh, concentrations. And this is just another method. That was the absolute. This is the relative uh, measurements as far as ammonium nitrate, contributing about 30, 32 uh, micrograms of the PM 2.5 concentrations in Bakersfield where you can see the carbon being less. And then in Fresno, it is, it's, it's a less contribution as far as the total PM 2.5 concentrations. So for the scientists out there or the chemists out there, I apologize for the simplistic, but this is just a, a, a simplified version of why we think ammonia uh, controls are not the way to go and NOx controls really are. So on the far left, you can see there's a number of ammonia uh, particles that are in the, or um, molecules in the atmosphere. You have NOx uh, that, the molecules in the atmosphere that will react with the ammonia to form the particulate or ammonium nitrate. And so for us, I think Sally was saying it, um, we're overly abundant of uh, ammonia in the San Joaquin Valley. And so, the basic of it is if you reduce the, the uh, pollutants or the precursor of less abundance, you're not going to see as much reaction. And so I'll go through a little bit more detail, more hopefully scientific, uh, based on that. But that overly simplistic analysis um, was there just to illustrate uh, the need for understanding the science behind it. And so I wanted to go over just real briefly uh, the California Regional Particulate Matter Air Quality Study, often referred to as CRAPAX. This was a major field study. Uh, the, the, the district's air resources, California Air Resources Board, EPA, and a number of partners spent over $50 million to study particulate matter. The first PM standard, the ambient air quality standard, was promulgated in 97. This study happened two years right after a three-year-long study. Um, it's been the foundation of our PM 2.5 plans. Uh, we consider the San Joaquin Valley Air Basin as one of the most studied air basins in the nation, uh, and it continues to be the cornerstone of the research. Just real briefly, this is the CRAPAX modeling domain. It covers this far, most of California. Um, uh, way, way to the top of California. I think 300,000 grid cells uh, encompass this modeling domain. So very extensive modeling was conducted. So in the CRAPAX field study, we also had monitors that were measuring actual ammonia and nitric acid concentrations. Here's a snapshot of ammonia versus nitric acid concentrations in the Fresno area. And you can see that there's a lot more ammonia compared to the nitric acid um, in the Fresno area. This is more uh, urban location. The next slide is even more prominent. Uh, you can, uh, just real briefly, the left-hand column only goes up to about 20 micrograms as far as the scale goes. Uh, this left-hand column for the next site, which is in Angiola, this is basically halfway between Fresno and Bakersfield. It was, uh, th this monitoring site was put in a farm, no, um, no uh, metropolitan area around it, and the ammonia concentrations were twice, three times as high uh, as the Fresno monitoring station, where the nitric acid concentrations were still within the same range, and so you can see that there's definitely a lot more ammonia emissions in the San Joaquin Valley. So here's a uh, simplified, uh, well actually there's, there, there's a, a number of reactive nitrogen compounds that are emitted into the air and form it in the atmosphere. Um, we begin with uh, NOx emissions which are directly emitted. NOx is generally NO, NO2 with the majority of it being NO. Um, and then on the far right-hand side is the ammonium nitrate. And so all of these reactive compounds, it's the ammonium nitrate that we're 
I'm sorry, it's, sorry, the nitric acid, I apologize, is that the, the, the uh, nitrogen compound that we're concerned with because it's the nitrogen, um, the nitric acid that reacts with the directly emitted ammonia emissions to form uh, the particulate, the ammonium nitrate. So how, how does the NO emissions or the NOx emissions get formed into uh, the nitric acid? So in the summertime in the San Joaquin Valley and in the South Coast Air Basin, it's hydroxyl radicals that are responsible for converting that NO or NOx emissions to um, the N2O5 and then into the um, um, nitrog nitric acid. But in the winter time, it's not the case. In the winter time, it's it, and we we've seen through a, a number of studies that it's ozone that reacts with the nitrogen or NOx emissions to basically form that secondary um, or form that reaction to get down to the nitric acid. And in the South uh, South Coast Air Basin, they've also found that it's ozone pollution that occurs during the day that stays in the evening time and then it's the evening reactions that form that uh, the nitric acid. But in the San Joaquin Valley, we don't have that same chemistry. We're not creating the localized um, uh, ozone pollution. What we've determined or what we've found through our studies is that there's ozone that's being transported into the San Joaquin Valley Air Basin. Uh, about 30 to 40 parts per billion that gets transported into the air basin during the winter time, and that's the oxidant that's pushing that reaction. So unfortunately, we don't have a way to control that because it's, it's not being generated here in the San Joaquin Valley. It's, it's again, it's transported into the air basin. Um, so what we need to do is, is figure out how to control those that, that reaction. And so if we don't have direct control over the ozone pollution, and we know that the ammonia emissions are abundant, it points to the fact that we need to control the NOx emissions, the localized NOx emissions, to break that equation and lower the particulate formation. So why, why or I guess you ask whether or not we're seeing a lot of ammonium nitrate in the summertime. But what we find out is ammonium nitrate isn't formed as uh, frequently in the summertime because it's very temperature dependent. And so you get the hydroxyl radicals, the OH, reacting with the, um, the ammonium nitrate, or I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the NOx emissions to form, uh, to form the nitric acid in the summertime, and then the nitric acid will react with ammonia in the summertime. But when you reach a certain temperature level, the, the, uh, the ammonium nitrate doesn't phase out into a particulate form. So it stays gaseous in the summertime. And so we don't see as much ammonium nitrate contribution in the summertime. And so this is another example, very similar to the pie chart that I showed below, or showed earlier, was that was a pie chart on a daily ammonium nitrate concentration. It was about 65% in Bakersfield, 54% uh, in, in Fresno. In the summertime, we don't see, or on an annual basis, we don't see the same thing. It's only about 35, uh, 37, 33% in the various. And so there's definitely not as much ammonium nitrate uh, throughout the year or uh, in the summertime. So the CRAPAC study also did a number of things to look at how do we get controls or how do we lower the PM emissions associated or concentrations in the San Joaquin Valley. This one is a base case um, where you start on the upper left hand corner is a base case. This was a 1996 uh, episode where you can see really high concentrations of PM 2.5 in the, in the basically center of, of the San Joaquin Valley Air Basin. So they, they did a modeling analysis and they took a 50% reduction in NOx emissions and modeled th that case. And you can see the, redu the, the reduction in emissions, the concentrations are a lot lower, making that 50% assumption. And we know there's more than just NOx as a precursor, so they did it for v also VOCs and ammonia. And those are the two lower slides. 
Uh, VOC makes a little bit of, a, of an impact, but a 50% VOC reduction for the San Joaquin Valley is unrealistic. Um, there's just way too much VOC emissions biogenically, anthropogenically, that it, it's not realistic or cost effective. And then similarly, you can look at the ammonia reduction uh, modeling analysis. It's still pretty red in the center of, this, of, of the chart. Not a lot of movement as far as PM concentrations if you reduced ammonia through this modeling exercise. So a, a, a different team took a look at uh, more recent, uh, the 2000, that was 1996, this is 2000, 2001, and they did a similar analysis where they took a 50% reduction in NOx emissions, and you could see the reduction in PM 2.5 or PM fine when you reduced 50% NOx. You were seeing about a 50% reduction um, as a base case, about 30%. Uh, as a worst case for reducing PM 2.5 or PM fine. And then the, the, the small blue blips up here uh, are the reductions uh, in PM when you took a look at or you modeled uh, PM, I'm sorry, ammonia emissions by 50%. And that's where, where this is the science behind why we think it's, it's just not realistic to go after ammonia. Um, again, I think, again, Sally said it, ammonia comprises about 85% 80, 80, of the uh, inventory from ag, and you can't really control ammonia emissions by 50%. There's no technologies that exist out there. There's nothing that's cost effective that's out there to get you this reduction. And so to pursue a strategy to get us minimal, less than five, 10 percent PM reductions, the San Joaquin Valley Air District would rather focus on what we think is the better uh, strategy, which is NOx controls. And then the, my last slide here, uh, as far as the charts go, uh, is, is showing the demonstration that we're seeing the NOx emissions in a trend, a downward trend between 2000 and 2010 is following a very similar downward trend when you look at ammonium nitrate at that same Fresno monitoring site. So for the San Joaquin Valley, because we're serious non-attainment for a 1997 standard, we still have a long ways to go to meet the 2006 and the 2012 PM 2.5 standards. We need to continue to leave no stone unturned. Um, we're looking at a number of regulations, whether it's additional NOx regulations or, or directly emitted 2.5 regulations. Uh, we're, we have a very robust incentive program trying to get through that. Um, we, we emphasize technology advancement, which is trying to figure out are there technologies that can get us there faster? Zero emissions technologies, fuel cell technologies, electric technologies. And then I think this is a great component as far as what Sally was saying is our policy and outreach efforts as, uh, as far as working with EPA to let them understand the difficulties, making sure that, the, that any new regulations are based on the best science, um, addressing the, the, some of the pitfalls associated with the Clean Air Act and things like that. So that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, the one thing I did want to mention is we are setting the foundation as far as navigating through all of this regulatory uncertainty. Uh, our district is looking to adopt the first serious PM 2.5 plan um, in the nation. It hasn't been done yet. It's going to our board in April. EPA is going to have to act on that uh, in order to approve us. Um, and move forward and so some of the decisions in these next coming months should hopefully clear up uh, some of the policy deci decisions moving forward with respect to any regulations. Thank you.